I'd just like to clarify before we get started that this video isn't exactly intended for complete beginners. This is not a how to sew a straight seam video or a what sewing machine to buy video. This is not about your first project. This video may have useful little nuggets for anyone, but I'm primarily speaking to those of you who have a sewing machine, have finished a few projects, and now want to lay out a path to expand your skills and use the things you make in practical daily life. I took some sewing lessons as a kid, and then through my middle and high school years I kept at it, using my mom's sewing machine and hacking up old curtains. I got slightly better as time went on, but mostly only in the realm of costumes. Actual clothing eluded me for some reason. Probably because costumes don't have to be comfortable or hold up to washings. You want a costume to stand out as obviously your own work in a way you usually don't want your daily wear clothing to scream, homemade. So daily wear clothing became a bit of a hang-up for me, and that didn't really change until three years ago, when I made one simple rule for myself. One little rule that really did change everything. I shan't make you wait until the end of the video. Here's the rule. I simply decided to stop buying clothes. And it actually worked! I've been thinking about this video for literally years, and I think I figured something out. How this little rule worked is complex, but why it worked is extremely simple. It worked because it wasn't about changing my actions, it was about changing my mindset. Like breaking any other addiction, it wouldn't have worked if I just tried to shut down my desire for beautiful clothing. Instead, I had to find a better source of fulfillment. Not shopping, but creating. Once my mindset changed, my actions followed of their own accord, and I began to build a new foundation, so that when I looked at clothing, whether it was in a store or online or on another person, I stopped thinking, I like that, I want that, where can I find that or buy something similar? Instead I started to think, I like that. I want something kind of like that, except I'd rather the skirt be longer, and I wish it wasn't polyester, and I'd want the fit to be better for my body type. I'll bet I could make that. However, how this rule worked is just as important. When I was fresh out of high school, I read The 4-Hour Workweek by Timothy Ferris. While I don't recommend the book as a complete guide to life, there were incredibly valuable lessons I took from it. One was the utter uselessness of vague resolutions and goals. Your goals need to be specific, and you must thoroughly plan a path to actually achieve them. Otherwise, the likelihood of wandering through life and finding yourself at the right destination is very, very low. So, I'm going to walk you through eight specific questions to ponder and steps to take so that you can begin working towards the goal of a hand-sewn wardrobe. Please, if this is a serious desire of your heart, then take this video seriously. Grab some paper and take notes. Pause the video and really think about the questions. Write out your answers essay style so that you can review them later if you need fresh encouragement. Okay? Let's go. I put out a poll on Instagram and there was a huge response, the largest I've ever gotten on a post. I asked my followers why they want to make their own clothes. I think this is an important question to consider first because the route you take will largely depend on why you want to get there. I read every single response and I think they boil down to four broad categories. Ethics, expression, quality, and passion. With ethics and passion, the motivation behind your sewing was very important to you. With quality and expression, it was the result that mattered more. With ethics and quality, you have very practical reasons to sew, and with passion and expression, you are more driven by creativity. Ethics was a big one for people and encompassed sustainability, or not participating in consumerism and giving money to megacorporations. It also included environmentalism, or not contributing to waste and man-made plastic fibers being thrown out. Anti-exploitation, not supporting the textile industry and modern-day slave labor. And I'll also include self-sufficiency, or the skills to autonomously make what you need and want with your own hands rather than relying on the system. And modesty, the ability to make nice clothing that covers your body to an extent that puts your mind at ease, which can be hard to do when your standards aren't reflected by current fashion trends. Another big category is quality. It's really hard to find clothing made from good natural fibers, or really any quality material. Store-bought clothing is made for a profit, so it's made with the cheapest, easiest, fastest construction methods, and it's not made to last. It's also very difficult for most people to find clothing that fits them well. Whether you are plus-sized, super tall, busty, or short-waisted like me, every body is unique, and it's the rare unicorn amongst mass-produced clothing that actually fits you perfectly. And then, of course, there is the affordability. Well-made clothing in linen or wool or silk does exist, but it's booty expensive. You could theoretically commission custom-made clothing tailored to your body and detailed exactly how you want, 
But I'm going to guess that 99.9% .9 of the people watching this video are not that rich. And of course, there is comfort. Dressing comfortably is important to everyone, but it is particularly challenging for people with specific clothing requirements or accessibility issues. The next category was expression. Many people like unique clothing that shows their individual personality. Maybe you like particular styles of clothing that simply aren't available to you. Or maybe you love clothing with careful design details and artistry. You can take a lot of pride from sewing your own clothing, increasing your personal satisfaction and positive emotions. And it is also just so empowering to be able to decide for yourself exactly what you need and want to wear, and to have the confidence that you are really capable of making it a reality. And the last category is passion. This encompasses many wonderful things outside the realm of pure practicality. The simple love of sewing. There is the joy of learning a new skill or satiating your curiosity. There is the peace and relaxation that many people get from working with their hands. There is the creative outlet. Some people simply must create. They need the work even more than they need the result. And there was one suggestion that I hadn't even thought of. Sewing as a form of connection to your heritage and family traditions. There will certainly be motivations I've missed, or ones that you don't really feel fit neatly into any category, but I did my best to cover as wide a range as possible. A good exercise for you would be to write down your top five or six motivations. All of these are good motivations, and you may feel like most of them apply to you, but try to honestly hone in on your top priorities, knowing that the others will still be side benefits, even if they aren't your focus. This will impact how you sew and plan your projects. For example, if your priorities are with environmentalism and affordability, then buying thrifted fabric will be a good strategy. If your priorities are comfort and natural fibers, then you'll most likely have to search online for the right fabrics and probably have to save up and pay a bit more for them. And if you care most about design, detail, and artistry, you will probably want to look for unique fabrics and prints and ways to further embellish them, and that's okay. Just think and write out what your priorities are and why. And if you've been feeling lost or overwhelmed, hopefully it will bring you a sense of clarity and direction. Now that you know why you sew, let's identify what you want to make. This is admittedly something I've really struggled with, and I'm not even close to living up to my own ideals. You do need to let go of the allure of rapidly changing fashion trends and current styles. It's simply unworkable with a hand-sewn wardrobe, where you'll be investing considerably more thought, money, and time than you would just buying something trendy from Shein. This is very liberating, and for me it was easy. I was never very interested in mainstream fashion to begin with. However, there is another side of this that I did fall into hard. You can find yourself attempting to copy anything or anyone, regardless of mainstream fashion. This isn't necessarily wrong, and you can learn a lot from studying and analyzing your icons. But I don't believe you'll truly be satisfied by copying another person without putting your own creativity into it, or consideration for your needs and lifestyle. I definitely did this in my younger years with a fictional character, Clara Oswald from Doctor Who. But I realized recently that I had fallen into it again. If you're in the historical costuming community, you might have guessed where I'm going with this. History bounding. It's kind of like in Dominic Noble's adaptation videos where he has a whole category for because Lord of the Rings did it. Well, I kind of feel like now the internet has an entire category for because Bernadette Banner did it. I definitely see it on myself looking back at my last couple years of work. And again, there's nothing wrong with emulating your icons to an extent, but I don't think I was really thinking it through. I was very caught up in the beauty and presentation of Bernadette's videos. She is really good at her job. But is the style Bernadette presents truly your style? In hindsight, I think a much, much more useful approach is to analyze the aesthetics and icons you're drawn to, and to try and isolate exactly what about them you really truly love and want to emulate, rather than attempting to poorly copy and paste the whole image. To do this, think of what you've always been drawn to, as far back as you can remember. What is your recurring dream? The aesthetic that never fails to snare your attention? The Pinterest pin that has lived rent-free in your brain for years, and every time you see it again you find it just as strikingly beautiful. That is where you might begin to find your own true style. Try to categorize and group different elements, and then narrow it down to five or six aesthetics that seem to be the most elementally alluring to you. Write about them, and what each encompasses. Silhouettes, material, color palettes, novelty details. Sketch them out, or categorize your Pinterest pins. Really think about it, and take your time. Don't go on a Pinterest binge and find all sorts of new inspiration right now. Draw from your memory and the looks that you have long found deeply, intrinsically attractive. 
This will be a very personal process, so allow me to demonstrate, as this is something I really need to do for myself anyways. I never did it from the start, and I think that that's where I've hit a lot of roadblocks in the last three years. As I mentioned, Clara Oswald was my first fashion icon. Even though her character debuted a decade ago, and a lot of the specific fashion trends are pretty outdated by normal standards, I would still trade my entire wardrobe for hers in an impulsive heartbeat. So what about her style lines up with something so strongly innate to myself? After much consideration, I think I figured it out. It's the contrast within her clothing. She usually wore extremely classically feminine dresses, jewelry, and makeup, but it was contrasted and mixed with chunky boots and jackets and leather and buckles and motorcycling gear. Something about that contrast, beauty and strength, delicacy with kick-ass, it just really spoke to me. So for my first two categories, I'll put classically feminine, which to me encompasses dresses and skirts, flattering fit and flare silhouettes, delicate lace details, pin tucks, and floral prints. A good but broad foundation. Another category is utilitarian contrasts, though mine might look a little bit different from Clara's. Edgy moto boots and leather jackets? Yes. But I also love useful things and multifunctional clothing. So things like scuffed up steel-toed work boots, hiking gear, knee patches, utilitarian details like buttons, zippers, pockets, and pouches. Anything that speaks to me of capability, competency, and the edge behind an otherwise classically feminine look. Another category is what I'll call vintage librarian. You see that style all over Pinterest. It's definitely not true vintage, but it's what I like. I think that aesthetic is partly what draws me to Bernadette's style, and also Rachel Mixie's. It's the earth tones and tweedy wools, knit sweaters, oxfords, belted skirts and blouses. It's a style that I've always found beautiful, going back years and years and years. The fourth category is similar, but slightly distinct. I call it Woodland Sprite. <laughs> It's also very similar to Rachel Makesy and a clothes horse on Instagram. To me, it's less about the style of clothing so much as it is about the detail work. Little embroidered elements, inspiration from forest animals, insects, vines, leaves, flowers, mushrooms, and moss, light wispy fabrics contrasted with rough leathers. If there's a beauty button in my brain, then these little details hit it hard. And the fifth category is a bit different, but I think it's worth mentioning. It's really similar to the, like, sunny boho girl aesthetic. Something about that just really gets me and has not left. I think it's all of the layers of texture and color combined with this sun-bleached look. I'm not sure exactly how it'll combine with the other categories, which seem a bit more naturally cohesive. It might be that Vintage Librarian, Woodland Sprite, and Sunny Boho are all points on a temperature spectrum, from winter cold to summer heat, with the more moderate spring and summer weather bridging them. This does make sense with the fabric choices for each, and the alternating color palettes I'm drawn to over the course of a year. Okay, so I realized that was probably a little long-winded, but I'm hoping that by showing you a bit about how I've figured out my personal style, you can think about yourself and what you really, truly, deeply love and want to wear. Think, if you could wear anything, what would you choose? And how would you then begin to blend that with your practical clothing needs? Take a moment and look at what you're wearing now. Probably something comfortable. This is going to be a longer video, so 50% chance that it's pajamas. <laughs> Consider what you wore yesterday and what you're going to wear tomorrow. Think about the contents of your wardrobe. Take a break from the video if you want and go look inside your closet. Dreams aside, what do you actually wear and why do you wear it? Consider the evolution of your style over the years and the evolution of your needs. Maybe you've moved recently between rural and urban or to a different climate or a different job. The functionality of your wardrobe will need to adapt as your lifestyle changes. Something that I think is important to stress, don't start from scratch. Don't decide you dislike everything you own in favor of a vision of your ideal style. You own the clothes you own for a reason. There must be something about them you like. The way a particular piece fits, a unique detail, the neckline, or even just the functionality. I think it would be a mistake to disregard your comfortable, worn-in clothing in favor of a fantasy. You may think you want to wear a corset every day, and there's nothing wrong with trying one out, but try to keep your daily life in mind, and the casual, comfortable clothing that you know you'll choose to wear 90% of the time, rather than the Instagram outfit. It's springtime, and maybe you're about to swap out your winter clothes for summer clothes. Or vice versa, you southern hemispheres. Take the opportunity to inventory your wardrobe. What pieces do you love and why? Which ones do you wish you had five more of? Which ones do you only keep because you love just one little tiny detail? Which are extremely versatile? Which ones do you hang on to even though they don't work with anything you own? What might make them work better? 
Compare what you own to the ideal style we discussed earlier. Do your favorite pieces fit into any of those categories? If not, you might need to reconsider the categories. What pieces are already ideal? What makes them so? This step is important. It's about grounding yourself. The previous step was about dreaming big and imagining, but this step is meant to bring you back to Earth. Dressing like a time traveler just isn't going to work for everyone, and you can waste a lot of valuable time and resources and become discouraged if you shoot for an ideal that isn't rooted in your daily life. This is an extension of the previous step. Everyone has requirements their wardrobe must meet for daily life, often related to climate and occupation. My sister is a deaf educator, and so she has a dress code specific to signing. Solid colored tops, no large necklaces or bracelets, simple necklines, nothing that will distract from her hands. Or a different example, my other sister is a hairstylist, and it's important for her wardrobe to demonstrate to her clients that she has good taste. She also needs good, comfortable shoes for long hours on her feet, and her work clothing is primarily black, to hide the stains from hair dye. Maybe you work in a professional environment, or maybe you are in school and wear a uniform. Maybe your occupation is primarily childcare, something I did for several years. In that occupation, I required clothing that was comfortable, flexible, and washable, so primarily knits. These elements are important to consider because they aren't about your style or what you like. They are simply what you need, the non-negotiables, and they are the clothing that you'll be spending about 40 hours a week wearing. <laughs> Take a moment and think about how these requirements are showcased in your favorite pieces. Think about how you might combine them with the ideal styles we discussed earlier. Take notes and begin to form a picture in your head, bringing it all together. Why you want to make clothing to begin with, the ideal styles you want to make, the state of your current wardrobe, the practical realities of your life, and the specific requirements you need clothing to fulfill. All right, now that you've thoroughly thought it out, let's make a plan. With the contents of your wardrobe freshly in mind, begin to mentally, or literally, group your clothing into categories. This will be much easier if you already have a small, tidy wardrobe. If you've got like a stuffed walk-in closet, well, do the best you can. You might need a purge, but that's not what this video is for. Keep in mind, the wardrobe I'm categorizing today is not the same wardrobe I started with three years ago. It is much smaller and simpler. I identified 15 categories in my wardrobe, though yours may differ. The largest category is my daily wear, which includes casual dresses, blouses and skirts, stretchy knits, pants, shorts, and leggings, all of the basics. Another large category are my dressy casuals, or the clothing slightly too nice or stiff for regular work days, but perfect for going out, visiting with friends, having dinner, a date, a family event, going to church, etc. And my third category in this vein is my special occasion wear. Dresses nice enough for a formal party or a wedding. Another important category is underclothing, in which I'm including panties, bras, and tights. I'm not showing you mine. Socks I've put into a different category, knitwear, along with sweaters, cardigans, hats, scarves, arm warmers, and the like. This category I've separated because I would like to make these items someday, in theory, if I ever get over my irrational loathing of knitting needles. Other types of clothing you might want categories for are athletic clothing, sleepwear, and workwear or dirty clothes. I also have a category for swimwear, though I live very far from any ocean, so the little swimwear I do have is geared more towards canoeing and river adventures. And then there are categories like outerwear, shoes, bags, jewelry, and accessories. These are my categories, but you might need to include professional wear. You might need activity-specific clothing, such as for horseback riding, motorcycling, skiing, or other physical hobbies. Other suggestions were for traditional or cultural clothing, costumes, team spirit clothing, and festival clothing. Maternity clothing was suggested, and if you have kids, you might need to tweak your categories to separate your more hard-wearing clothes. Protective clothing like aprons and smocks might be needed by artists and tradespeople. Some people might require medical wear, and if you travel frequently, you might have categories just for that. Each individual will have a separate set of categories, and what all you include in a category will be very personal. Also, some categories will be much more expansive and important for you than they are for others. I only have a few items of athletic clothing, but that's all I need. You might need more or less. I need more workwear than average, I think, because of all of the gardening and homesteading and projects that I do. If you live in a hot climate, you might need very little knitwear and outerwear. And in a cold climate, you'll need a lot more. The important thing is to try and mentally organize yourself, and then analyze your different categories to get an idea of where to begin your sewing. Now, looking at your categories, consider your sewing. Consider your skills and the skills you want to learn. 
Consider your priorities. What categories need the most attention? Which categories do you rarely need to buy for? And what categories of clothing do you go through quickly? Begin to sort your categories by three labels, priority, stasis, and cheat. The priority categories are those where you feel competent enough to begin making your own clothes, or at least trying. These should include the clothing that you wear often, because sewing your own will make a big impact quickly. I decided to include all of the daily wear, dressy casual clothing, and special occasion clothing. This is what I wanted to focus on, and where I felt confident enough in my sewing to at least try making my own. The cheat categories are those that you will allow yourself to buy clothing in for whatever reason. My cheat categories were underclothing and knitwear. I would like to make my own of those two someday, but it's important not to overcommit lest you burn out. And with those two categories, eh, sometimes you just need underwear. I was concerned when I started that my shopping addiction might simply shift focus. Like if I couldn't buy the pretty dress I wanted, what if I just started buying an unnecessary number of sweaters instead? That did not happen at first. I think for the first two years, I was really good and really solid. However, within the last year, I have slipped a bit and just started buying things in the knitwear and underclothing categories just because I wanted them. And it's okay to slip up. As I make this video, I am reorganizing for myself and recommitting. <laughs> The vast majority of my categories I put under the stasis label. This basically means that I didn't really need anything in those categories. The clothes I had in them were fine and should last me for years. Typically, purchases I make in these categories are just because I want the thing. For the future, I decided that if I wanted something new in one of those categories, it would be cool to try and make it instead of buying it. But if I really needed something, I wouldn't unduly pressure myself or stress myself out. I would allow myself to just go buy it. Another label you might consider is a thrift label. I didn't use this, but it might benefit you to allow yourself to buy items, but only through thrifting. I didn't do much thrifting because I felt like it might become an easy way out for myself, and I wanted a bit of that incentive to make more. But if your priorities are bent towards removing yourself from the fast fashion industry completely, like now, thrifting is an excellent option. It's important not to overburden yourself with the amount you try to take on at once, especially if you're still learning, which really we all are. I think it's effective to really try and push yourself to make the things you want, but it can be really counterproductive to try and force yourself to make the basic things you need. Now, finally, plan your first projects. Look at your priority categories. What are you lacking? What would be a fun, versatile piece to add to the mix? Do you have a favorite dress you could clone? For myself, at this current stage, I need nothing in my dressy casual and special occasion categories. But my daily wear category needs desperate attention, particularly in the spring and summer clothing. I want to make a few simple shirt dresses. Comfortable, lightweight dresses that can be worn solo or paired with skirts for more versatility. I also could use some lightweight summer skirts. I have little in the way of tops or shorts, but I won't be too concerned with that, especially if I get the shirt dresses and the skirts made. I also want to make a simple vest, as Rachel Mixie has demonstrated how versatile vests can be in a wardrobe. I want to clone my favorite summer dress. It is so comfortable, I love it, and wear it almost every day. But it's gotten very holy, and the straps have definitely stretched out. Other things I'd like to try and make are a basic daily bra, as my current one will soon need to be replaced. Also, sandals. I tried once before, but my daily summer sandals are about two years overdue to be replaced. With both of these, I would like to make them, but if I don't have time, I'll just have to cave and buy something, and that's okay. I don't usually make work clothing, usually I just retire old pieces, but I would like to make a vintage-inspired jumpsuit or overalls for rough work, out of some nice sturdy fabric with lots of pockets and knee pads. And before winter comes again, I want to tackle tailoring and make a heavy wool coat, as my favorite leather jacket is not terribly warm to begin with, and after five years of daily wear, the zipper is starting to give out. So, take some time and dream and sketch. Or, if you'd rather not draw, collect some Pinterest inspirations. Try to focus on a small number of pieces that will be the most versatile with the clothing you already own. If you're a beginner sewer, start with simple pieces. If you're a bit more advanced, focus on perfecting the fit. And if you want to go to the next level, see where you can add more detail and finer finishings. By now, you should have generated an idea of what your perfect wardrobe would look like. You have organized your current wardrobe and planned your first projects. You've settled on the items of clothing that you'll still allow yourself to purchase, and for everything else, you have a strategy to replace them. Armed with this plan, stop buying clothes. Commit to it. Fix your mind on the goal. Do you want a homemade wardrobe? Will going shopping help you get it? Or will it just satiate you in the moment? Will buying a new dress today motivate you to make one tomorrow? If it still seems like too much, set a time limit for yourself. 
Try it for one month, six months, a year. How long do you think you could commit to? Can you be satisfied with what you have for that long? Or can you channel your dissatisfaction into motivation to start and actually finish your projects? If you decide to try it out, let me know in the comments and on Instagram. Tag me in posts about your planned projects, your newly finished pieces, and your ongoing efforts to change your mindset. Stop buying clothes. <laughs> so, how well has this actually worked for me? Well, I originally only planned on going for one year, and now I'm over three, so I would say shockingly well. I haven't been perfect. I bought a bridesmaid dress in 2020, but I sort of had to. I bought some swimwear at a Goodwill in Florida when we went on vacation in 2019. I only took one swimsuit because it was my first ever beach vacation and I didn't really understand sand. It's coarse, and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. There are a few things I've picked up from thrift stores or as hand-me-downs. Last winter I went on Poshmark and I found my favorite shirt in like a dozen colors. That was a little overboard, but not by much since those shirts have formed the backbone of my winter wardrobe ever since. But for the rest of it, I found that I was mostly happy with what I had. I could have replaced my sandals last year, or the year before, but I keep holding off because I really, really want to try making them. I quit buying junk jewelry, and instead I've tried making my own, supporting a few small businesses, and I bought a couple of nice pieces. Even when I made myself allowances, aside from the slip-up with underclothing, <laughs> I found that I just wasn't that interested. And this is where the mindset change really shows itself. I quit going to stores, stopped shopping online, and stopped searching for things to want to buy. Instead, I began thinking of ways I could make the things I want, and new ways I could use the things I already owned. I started actually putting in the effort to repair clothes I love. I shunned Pinterest for a while, but when I did get back on it, I found that I was no longer looking for things to purchase, I was looking at design elements I was inspired by and wanted to try out for myself my source of fulfillment completely changed, from the brief endorphin rush of buying something to the harder earned but much deeper satisfaction I feel every time I put on a garment I've made myself. It's a very vintage value, but it's one that I deeply wish we could rediscover as a culture. So yes, it seems to me that it really does come down to just one rule. If you want to motivate yourself to make your own clothes, you have to stop buying them. Simple as that. We live in a world where you have an easy out, and you have to decide for yourself to give it up. 